sir now let's go to the next uh, first topic of the day dr shrikant uh, who has been uh, a specialist in uh, hematological oncology he did his uh, post graduation and specialization and research training in uh, uk and has been practicing in uk as senior consultant in hematology and hemato oncology over a period of 20 years in premier institutions like Royal Marsden Hospital, Saint George uh, Healthcare, uh, Hammersmith Hospital, London Institute of Cancer Research. All these are all very prestigious in institutes of uh, UK, and uh, he has uh, performed and presented so many research papers in the field of hemato oncology. Few of which to be noted down is uh, effect of P13 kinase inhibition in multiple myeloma phase one and drug in development in multiple myeloma. and for which he has been awarded the prestigious awards the right gcrf fellowship uh, and uh, md drug multi drug resistant development in uh, uh, multiple myeloma so his special interest is multiple myeloma leukemias lymphomas and uh, he will be talking to uh, talking to us about uh, the topic how to suspect chronic myeloid leukemia in early stages over to you dr shrikant sir thank you uh, just trying to see whether my slides are there uh, can you see my slides or have we got the slides there by any chance or Share your screen, please. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, Are you on an iPad or the computer? I'm on the i MacBook actually. MacBook, you will find uh, on the bottom row. You will find a green uh, share screen. Uh huh. If you click, I actually the emailed screen. the presentation as well. Come again. I've actually emailed the presentation as well in case uh, if you have. Uh, I am. Um, I'm trying to get it. Uh, getting it done, sir. Can you just uh, give me a moment? I'll share my screen, sir. Sure. If he can share his screen, then he can advance it himself. Sir, is it visible now? No. Just a moment, sir. now sir uh, it says okay how to suspect see ah, yes. okay yeah how to suspect yeah that's uh, correct sir yes sir yes thanks. sir you can go ahead and prompt me for your next slide yeah. sir yeah so many thanks for the kind uh, introduction and uh, allowing me to present my topic today uh, so first i would like to uh, talk about how to suspect and then i'll share a couple of uh, cases uh, real life cases uh, in the end uh, um so next slide please so first is uh, like how we uh, what is cml cml is basically uh, proliferation of your uh, stem cells that is the first uh, mother cells which come from the bone marrow from these cells actually uh, the red cells come the white cells come and the platelets come the white cells then again get divided into your uh, neutrophils then your lymphocytes your monocytes and then uh, they produce uh, give uh, immunity to the body now the etiology of cml uh, we don't know what the reason is the only thing what has been suspected is uh, irradiation in the past has been uh, recognized to cause that too high energy atomic uh, irradiation so more or less we don't have any uh, reason why uh, these stem cells get affected but what we know is there is a mutation which develops in the uh, chromosomes and it develops between 9 and 22 most commonly 80 to 90% of the cases then it forms a fusion uh, transcript known as the uh, uh, philadelphia chromosome and then the bcr able forms which upregulates your tyrosine kinase pathway and that causes the proliferation of your uh, white cells now the incidence is uh, quite an uncommon thing actually so uh, as hematologists we see quite a few but then in the general population i think incidence is somewhere around 1 in 100000 and then there is a 
age is more or less like 50 to 60 years of uh, age group is the age. So, and uh, there is a slight uh, female preponderance when you compare females to males. And sometimes it occurs even when you are, women are pregnant as well. Next slide. Next slide, please. So the next uh, cartoon is a slide where uh, you have a um, where you have the normal schema of your stem cells. That is the first uh, top end shows your uh, stem cells. That is the pluripotent hemopoietic uh, stem cells. From if you see in the left side, you have the erythroblast which forms the erythrocytes. And then in the right hand side, you have the megakaryocytes, which forms your thrombocytes, which is the platelets. Now, in the center, you have uh, divisions which form the white cell, the myeloblast. In that, you have your neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Then in the lymphoblast and the monoblast. Now, you can have leukemia in any of these uh, cell lines, like from erythroleukemia to megakaryocytic leukemia to myeloid leukemia to lymphoid leukemia to monoblastic leukemia. Now in CML, what happens is, as we see where the box is, uh, the, uh, it's more focused in, uh, in the stage where you have lots of neutrophils and lots of uh, myelocytes and also there's some amount of uh, basophils. So there is more proliferation uh, in the cell line there. Uh, next slide, please. Now the epidemiology, this is the general epidemiology which uh, happens worldwide. It's almost 3% of all the cancers in the human population. There is roughly around uh, 5 to 10 cases per 100,000 uh, population. Uh, and CML out of that accounts for almost 15 to 20% of any acute uh, adult leukemias. Incidence is around uh, 1 to 2 cases per 100,000 uh, population. The median age at diagnosis is uh, around 55 to 60 years. It's rare uh, in children and uh, people who are less than uh, 20 years. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is the study which was done at uh, Tata Memorial Hospital. And this looks at the Indian uh, data. And uh, out of the adult leukemias, here we have higher incidence of CML. There was around 10 to 20% in the overall worldwide, whereas in uh, our Indian population, this goes up to 30 to 60 percent. Uh, and again, here we have a slight reversal of the ratios. That is what we see here is uh, males being more affected than females. I don't know whether those are the ones which are being registered and having treatment or what is the difference between the two. Then the median age, again, here we see a more younger population at the region of around 30, whereas compared to 50 to 60 in the rest of the world. And most of the patients uh, who we see are uh, in the chronic phase, which is again quite reassuring because 90% uh, are in chronic phase. That means most of these patients can be cured and have a normal life because if they present later in life accelerated phase or blast crisis, it becomes quite yeah. difficult to manage them. And the median white cell count is around 45,000, normal platelet count and hemoglobin is around nine. Now uh, in 2010, they were in Calcutta alone uh, had 192 cases. So you could see what the, that is one particular state, you know. So you could roughly get an idea like how much uh, of uh, CML cases you would get uh, all over India. The most commonest symptom was uh, splenomegaly, which uh, led to uh, splenomegaly, then the hepatomegaly, then fatigue, weakness, and uh, pallor. And uh, younger individuals, lower so-called score and uh, complete hematologic response and cytogenetic response were predictors for uh, longer survival. And also early chronic phase, better tolerability to drug, more resistance were all uh, good uh, prognostic factors in long-term survival of patients with CML. The next slide, please. Now, moving on from how the uh, worldwide data and how the Indian data compared, we'll go into the history of the CML. Now, CML uh, normally has three phases. Now, uh, normally what we see is sometimes some, uh, we do a blood test for someone and we find a high white cell count or we examine someone who's got a clean. Then I think we uh, know this patient is suffering from a blood problem or blood-related issue. 
then we get the diagnosis. Mostly these patients are all asymptomatic group of patients. And these patients usually will fit in your chronic phase. And most of the CML cases, what we see will be along these lines. Say, for example, around 70% uh, of them will fall into this category where you would have done a routine MHC screening or a routine health checkup or someone would have examined and they would have found a splenomegaly. So it's mostly asymptomatic. This is your chronic phase and these are the patients who will do better. And I think if you look at the CBC, you will have a high white count. Sometimes they might have a borderline low anemia. White uh, platelet count might be usually raised in the higher end of the limit, maybe like 500 or 600. If you look at the peripheral smear, there will be rise in the white cells. There will be a neutrophils, which will be more. And also there will be uh, myelocytes, metamyelocytes and basophils. If you see the maturation of uh, neutrophils, usually how they form is from the stem cells, the myelocyte will come, then the myelocyte will come, and then metamyelocyte will come, then the band forms will come, and then the neutrophil matures. If you see in this, there are two stages of maturation. That is, one will be your uh, myelocyte, and the other would be your uh, neutrophil. So most of these white cells will be either your neutrophil or they would be your myelocytes. And also sometimes there would be blasts. Whereas in the chronic phase, the number of blast count will be always very less. So, and then if you look at the other parameters, for example, in the lab values, you'll have a low NAP score, then you can have a raised LDH. And then if you do an ultrasound, you could find a enlarged spleen. These patients, if you go and ask them, they might not have any symptoms. Sometimes they might say they've been feeling tired, weak, lethargic. They might have a vague uh, left-sided upper abdominal uh, pain and things. Then again, you have the second stage, which is the accelerated phase. Now the difference between the two stages is, if you look at the white count, it will be very higher. And also, if you look at the peripheral smear, there will be more number of immature cells, or there'll be more number of blasts which are present in the film. And also the other thing is, the symptoms, it is symptoms. that is your weight loss, your uh, night sweats, your abdominal pain and things will be more in severity as well. And patients might be uh, having a lot of symptoms compared to your uh, asymptomatic chronic phase. Now, blast crisis is nothing but what when a chronic myeloid leukemia patient has turned into acute leukemia. The blast percentage here is more than uh, uh, higher in number and it is uh, transformed into acute leukemia. So, all pra practical purposes, this is a patient who resembles more or less like an acute leukemia. Usually, patients who are present with blast crisis will either have myeloid blast crisis, or sometimes they might have a lymphoid blast crisis. Whichever blast crisis they present, usually the prognosis is not as good as your chronic phase or your accelerated phase. Sometimes CML patients can also present uh, uh, with bone pain or with skin lesions or with a metastatic lump uh, outside your bone marrow as well. So for all practical purposes, when we see someone uh, in the general population, if they're too well, and if they don't have a high blast count, they just have splenomegaly. It's mostly in your chronic phase. The next slide, please. Now, as I said, 30% are asymptomatic, fatigue, lethargy, weight loss, uh, night sweats. Splenomegaly will be there in almost 75% uh, uh, um, of the patients. And patients, they have... Uh, uh, abdominal fullness, early satiety once they start eating, also abdominal pain, and also sometimes if the spleen is very enlarged in size, it can undergo infarct, and you can develop pain in your uh, left uh, shoulder joint as well. Again, you can have uh, uh, bleeding and bruising because the platelets are uh, dysfunctional in uh, CML. So even if you have a, a high uh, platelet count, Patients with CML, you have to be careful not to do any procedure and also be careful not to give them any antiplatelet therapy because whatever the platelet count uh, they have might not be functioning unless they are being treated. And once they are treated, the platelet function can improve. Next slide. Now, again, these are very unusual uh, presentations uh, which we also come across. Gout because of the high elevated cell turnover, high uric acid. So patients can often present with symptoms of gout, such as pain in the first metatarsophalangeal joint of the great foot or uh, unilateral uh, joint pain. So gout can also be an underlying presentation of chronic uh, myeloid leukemia. Uh, 
the next one is the priapism. If you have a high white cell count, sometimes the blood flow circulation, a particular organ can be uh, impaired. So you can have priapism, which is quite painful and uh, could be problematic. Then the other, other unusual uh, findings are lymphadenopathy and hepatomegaly, which is present in chronic myeloid leukemia. Now, the other common thing which can be quite uh, problematic is leukostasis. Now, this is classical, like you have someone who comes uh, uh, quite unwell. They, these patients are usually very sick. The, the important target organs uh, are your uh, worrying ones are your chest and the other one is your central nervous system. So what happens basically is there's lots of these white cells are in the circulation. Typically, the count is somewhere around 200 to 300,000. Your white cell count is hemoglobin might be around five or six grams and platelets will be somewhere around 100 or uh, 50,000. So these high white cell count go and obstruct your circulation. So they will cause slowing of the circulation and there will be inflammatory cytokines which have been released into the circulation and this causes problem. Now, in the chest, classically, you have a whitened syndrome, what is known as uh, hypoxia, and you will have shortness of breath on exertion as well. And uh, patients have uh, typically uh, low oxygen levels as well. Uh, they might need uh, mostly uh, nah, some sort of uh, uh, ventilatory support or BiPAP. And uh, the immediate treatment would be is to uh, give them uh, supportive care for the uh, oxygenation and the second thing would be is to give cytoreduction that is giving urgent chemotherapy to reduce these uh, the other, other thing which can happen in the central nervous system will be uh, reduced uh, mental uh, alertness confusion coma and also patients might in severe cases have a uh, stroke as well because the blood flow and circulation will be impaired Again, uh, sometimes what we have to do is leukophorus then that is we connect them to a machine uh, like how you would have heard plasma pheresis uh, or you would have heard where we connect them to a machine and take the white cells alone from the circulation. What this does is it uh, once the white cell is removed, the sludging is reduced and the brain, brain uh, blood flow and the perfusion is improved. And similarly, even in, when you have a acute lung hypoxia or the CNS, what we do is uh, do a leukopheresis. Next uh, slide, please. So the diagnosis is basically simple blood count and a blood smear will most of the time tell you uh, whether this patient has got a CML because the high white count, the peripheral smear, the neutrophil, the myelocyte peak, the basophilia is usually the giveaway. And again, if you have someone with a high enlarged spleen, low lab score, LDH are again uh, things which could help us to uh, strengthen the diagnosis. Now the Diagnostic tests nowadays, we have moved from the peripheral blood and things is to the genetic assessment. So the bone marrow will tell us whether the patient is in chronic phase, accelerated phase or blast crisis because we will know the percentage of blast and on that basis, whether it's less than 5% or more than 20%, will define whether the patient is in chronic phase or accelerated phase or uh, it is in blast crisis. The next uh, thing would be is your uh, fish. Fish is basically a test where you know what chromosome is involved. So you have that probe with you and then you're putting on the sample and seeing whether that particular gene is there. So the fish probe, what we use is your 920 uh, Philadelphia chromosome, which is your 922 translocation. And then we have to confirm whether that is present. So if it is present, then we have uh, a diagnosis. Stereotyping will identify any other cytogenetic abnormalities other than uh, your translocation. Molecular study is looking at the... Uh, deeper level, that is your RT-PCR. So in that, we are looking at the uh, transcription protein, which is your BCR-able tra transcript here. Uh, there are two types of BCR-able transcripts. There's what is a, known as a P210 kilodalton protein one, and then there is a P190 kilodalton protein one. Now the Philadelphia chromosome, which is present in the chronic myeloid leukemia, has a P210 protein, whereas the one which is in your... Uh, Acute lymphoblastic leukemia for Chinese children is, is a typically a P190 uh, protein. Then again, you can do an imaging uh, like ultrasound or to find the splenomegaly. 
out of all of this the most important test for us to tell this patient has got cml would be your uh, bcr able and your fish for philadelphia proposal because that forms your defining diagnosis and that helps us to go on to the treatment because the treatment is aimed at targeting these uh, proteins that is your philadelphia chromosome the bcr able the tyrosine kinase so what we want to do is we want to stop the tyrosine kinase from proliferating and producing large number of white cells so our treatment is based on blocking that so we have to establish the diagnosis by proving uh, that this patient has got the philadelphia chromosome and the bcr able next slide please Ah, so this is the 922 translocation as you can see a part of chromosome 9 and a part of uh, 22 will uh, where the arrow is showing the 9th and the 22 there is uh, defects and then if you see uh, a new fusion protein has formed the 922 translocation and that is your bcr able and that is actually uh, uh, upregulating your tyrosine kinase which is producing more number of white cells next slide please so if you see the cml molecular genetics almost uh, 80% will just have philadelphia 10% will have philadelphia plus other chromosomes if you're doing a karyotype you will identify that now sometimes you might not have a philadelphia but you will have a bcr able uh, transcript so they these patients are known as philadelphia negative and bcr able uh, positive so in ideal world you will require a fish a karyotype and a bcr able if you are a purist to look at all three but then if uh, you could argue if you just have philadelphia chromosome you could treat it but always it's a good practice to see baseline all the uh, uh, genetic markers which is there because at a later date if someone develops you will know whether that's a new clonal evolution or not again in the accelerated phase you could have a myeloid blast crisis or lymphoid blast crisis myeloid usually has a plus 8 and a 17q chromosome abnormality and the lymphoid will have a chromosome 7 abnormality next slide please now we could have white cells uh, elevated white cells not all elevated white cells are cml because you know as we all know if we have a fever or infection common cold or a cough uh, Uh, we will have an elevated white cell count and again if you have rheumatoid arthritis or any arthropathy psoriatic or you have a, a skin lesion or you have a inflammatory bowel disease or crohn so you will have a elevated white cell so it is important to rule out all these conditions in infection inflammatory states before we say and label uh, the patient as cml then again we have other sorts of malignancies will have leukoerythroblastic blood picture again leukoerythroblastic blood picture also you will have elevated white cell count anemia thrombocytopenia so again we have to differentiate the elevated white cell count is because of the clonal rather than a reactive phenomenon now cml is a condition if i you remember in the first slide there was on the left side three different things with uh, myeloid then there was a monocyte component in the in this you have both myeloid and monocytic component present so you have both uh, monocyte and uh, as well as uh, uh, neutrophils present in your circulation as well so we call as chronic myelomonocytic leukemia here this is more like a myelodysplastic syndrome kind of a thing where patients usually will be more elder, elderly like 60 70 range and more or less if you look at the cells the cells will look a little bit abnormal as well because they don't look like they are normal cells and again these patients might have a skin rash and typically the patients will have anemia thrombocytopenia more blasts as well and if you look at the chromosomes the pattern which i said the philadelphia will be negative and again there will be other gene tests which will be positive and again treatment is totally different here because we give hypomethylating agent treatment like uh, is a cytidine we don't go for the tyrosine kinase inhibitor so it's important to know which one it is and again essential thrombocytosis in this the platelets are higher sometimes you can have also raised white cell count here if you do a mutation known as a jack mutation that is a janus kinase mutation jack2 jack2 mutation is positive as compared to your bcr able mutation in your chronic myeloid leukemia again essential thrombocytosis is more common in young women they can also present with an enlarged spleen here mainly people will present with either arterial events or a vascular events because when the platelets are uh, uh, 
rising in number, you will have a arterial or venous thromboembolism. So it's important to have the differential diagnosis in mind uh, before we label them as CML. But I think nowadays it's uh, quite standardized that we need to have a genetic marker like the Philadelphia chromosome or a BCR able to call this patient as chronic myeloid leukemia. So uh, it is much more easier. The problem becomes you have someone who doesn't fit this chronic myeloid leukemia, who doesn't fit with any of the myeloproliferative, but still has an elevated white cell count. And also uh, the differential diagnosis, there is nothing there. So then we call them as a atypical CML or a myeloproliferative disorder. Now the treatment of these patients will be just count control and things. Here we don't use the tyrosine kinase inhibitors or what we use for CMML. So it's important to identify which particular type of elevated white cell problem you're dealing with so that treatment can be targeted to that. So the next uh, slide. Now there are prognostic scores as well, whether you do good or whether you do bad. Now over the last 20 to 30 years, this has evolved. Uh, when I was a medical student uh, uh, and uh, studying MBBS, SOCAL score was uh, what was in use, whether you had good, moderate or poor. And I think it was dependent on your age, spleen size, blast count and platelet count. All you needed is the patient and the blood count, you know, and you could tell whether this patient had a high SOCAL, that means they did uh, the aggressive disease or a low SOCAL, that means the patient didn't do, uh, patient didn't have that much disease burden. Now, over the years, we have, have developed good complex uh, formulas, as you can uh, see, the Hasford and Utah score, which helps to prognosticate and tell us whether patients with CML will do better or how their prognosis is going to be. Uh, next slide, please. Now, treatment is, again, uh, you have various treatment options now. Uh, generalized approach is uh, you hydrate the patient because elevated white cell count, you don't want them to have a renal failure, high tumor load and things. And then you give them allopurinol or you can give them uh, uricosuric agent like a febutas and cytoreduction. We usually use hydria or we can use some sort of uh, chemotherapy, busulfan to bring the white count down. Now, once the count is controlled, the definitive treatment is tyrosine kinase inhibition. Like, just like how we have our uh, on, uh, older generation phones to your smartphones to your iPhones, like that we have 1G, 2G, and 3G now. So first generation uh, uh, was your imatinib. In the mid-90s when uh, CML started uh, coming, first imatinib was used and then it, for, it produced a good uh, hematologic response, cytogenetic response, and uh, almost 70 to 80 percent of them went into good remission. I think Novartis first uh, produced this uh, product. Then in uh, one to two years time when the study came, the IRIS trial, they found that almost 30 percent were discontinuing this medicine because of either you had skin rash or either your blood counts went down. Then they were forced to develop the newer molecule, which is the nilotinib. Now, nilotinib has gone through test of the time and it's uh, still standing the test of the time in two important things. One is uh, uh, patients with aggressive disease, you give them nilotinib, there is a very good response and within three months, you can see them in hematologic response and even patients have gone into cytogenetic response and within a year, you can see deeper molecular response as well and you have patients uh, uh, entering into remission. Now, both these drugs are like 1G, 2G, they will act on your BCR able. Now, then came the other second generation, like your dasatinib. Now, dasatinib, again, uh, is a very good drug as well. Again, it is equivalent to uh, nilotinib in its uh, profile as well. And also, it has uh, stood the test of the time. But the only difference, uh, I would say, is the side effect profile between the two of the agents. Nilotinib uh, sometimes has more arterial and vascular events as side effects, whereas dasatinib will have pleural effusion and... Uh, uh, effusions as your side effect and also cytopenias as well. So you have to choose which uh, patient and what you want to give. Now then came the 3G uh, we are like your bosotinib uh, which was used as well. Uh, again bosotinib is also equivalent in your uh, side effect profile as well. Now compared to your 1, 2G, 3G and uh, then came the ponatinib uh, which is your latest of your uh, tyrosine kinase. Ponatinib is used when you have mutations in the BCR able, that is like your T315i, then you can use your ponatinib as an indication. Now, 
one thing to note what the new concept now for these patients is it's not only treating them like how you treat diabetes or high blood pressure you treat them until you get a dcr able negativity then afterwards you try and stop these medicines this is what is known as the treatment free remission tfr now tfr is something which is a newer concept now nilotinib was the first one to introduce about this uh, tfr then came the dasartanib so when people were in two years of major molecular remission that is after taking uh, the drug two years uh, you are free from your disease you you stop the drug and then you monitor these patients then after two years almost 50 to 60% of patients remain still uh, uh, in remission and still uh, not taking the drug so in other so in other so in other so in other words what we are trying to say is not only we can we are we can control the disease almost half of the patients who are taking the second generation uh, tkis can achieve a cure as well that is after you achieve two years of major molecular remission so the the it looks much promising now each time as uh, time goes on because we are able to get more data and we are able to tell these patients that there is a chance you could be cured you know so going to the next uh, two slides which will be like a case presentations next slide now the first one is what we would all come across is the what forms the 80% of your cml patient coming from a routine health checkup high white count 35000 platelet is slightly higher 100000 everything is fine ultrasound has uh, 14 cm there is a 2 cm spleen on agali now bone marrow confirms it's cml is an asymptomatic patient still we will want to treat because we don't want this patient to go into blast crisis or accelerated phase and we want to cure them so even asymptomatic patients will need treatment will need investigation and uh, they have a good prognosis if you identify them early and you treat them next slide now next was a patient of mine who was an uh, chartered accountant who was in a second pregnancy she came to, uh, to me from uh, referred by a uh, obstetrician uh, in her first trimester and she had a uh, hemoglobin of 6 white cell count was very uh, elevated and platelets were high and uh, peripheral smear was neutrophil peak myelocyte peak and uh, we couldn't do a bone marrow because she was pregnant in the first consultation she was very much uh, fearful she didn't know whether she wanted to continue her pregnancy so in the blood itself because the white cell count is high we could send it off for fish and that was positive so we counseled her because there is almost 8 months to go and she has an elevated white count the chances if we leave her like that the white cell count will progress she could end up in a blast crisis acute leukemia and we might not succeed in treatment so the idea was to counsel her and if we have to treat her we can't give any of the medicines because all these medicines are contraindicated in pregnancy so she had to go for termination of her pregnancy next slide that we started her on hydria treatment and then the counts came down and then i started her on uh, first on imatinib and uh, she went on for almost 6 to 9 months and she was very religious in taking a medication uh, she didn't achieve a milestones what i meant by milestones in 3 months she should have a hematologic response 6 months she should uh, clear the disease and also she should have a good molecular response those targets didn't happen and also this patient was uh, talking to me about uh, when should I, when can i try for my pregnancy because my white count has gone back to normal so uh, i think it was easy for me then to switch her to nilotinib and then she started uh, nilotinib and uh, almost she is in 2 years she is in major molecular response i have seen her twice after her major molecular response twice she has been negative so almost she is uh, on the road to doing the tfr so the idea would be is in another year year and a half uh, when she reaches a two year goal uh, she can stop the medicine she can try for her uh, uh, pregnancy and hopefully uh, 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 that could happen as well and she will remain in uh, treatment free remission now with that i'll stop and uh, happy to take any questions uh,